Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today's video is a product family overview for Intel's 10th generation of core processors. I recently did a similar thing for AMD's third generation of Ryzen processors and the number one upvoted comment on that video requested an Intel 10th gen version. So here it is. This content will serve as a quick and easy reference for those of you wanting to compare Intel Core i3, i5, i7, and i9 series of processors. And it's quite rare that we feature all of these series in a single video. For example, when reviewing the Core i3-10100, none of the Core i7 or i9 processors were included, as $400 plus parts aren't usually relevant when reviewing entry-level processors, so we opt to remove them in an effort to declutter the graphs. Quite incredibly, Intel lists 17 individual standard power 10th gen core series desktop processors, though in reality there are just a handful of unique models. For example, while there are two distinct Core i9 models, the 10900 and 10900K, each has an alternate version without the GPU, dubbed the 10900F and 10900KF. But let's start from the bottom and then we'll work our way up. The 10th gen Core i3 range is quite interesting. All models feature four cores and eight threads thanks to the inclusion of hyperthreading. The base model, known as the 10100, operates at a base frequency of 3.6 GHz with a max turbo boost of 4.3 GHz and it packs a 6 MB L3 cache. Then there's the Core i3-10300 which gets a 100 MHz frequency bump plus a larger 8 MB L3 cache. And then we have the most powerful of the 10th gen Core i3s, the 10320. And it too receives the 8 MB L3 cache, but when compared to the 10300, runs at even higher clock speeds, boosting the base to 3.8 GHz with a max turbo of 4.6 GHz. So there's three 10th gen Core i3 models to pick from, but here in Australia, we really only have access to the Core i3-10100 at the moment. So that's what I'll be using to represent the Core i3 range today. Now, the 10th Gen Core i5 series, it consists of the 10400, the 10400F, 10500, 10600, 10600 k and the 10600KF. All models feature 6 cores with 12 threads and a 12 MB L3 cache. The non-K models are rated with a 65 watt TDP, while the unlocked K SKUs pack a 125 watt TDP. The F SKUs, of course, drop the integrated UHD graphics 630 engine, and this typically makes them a little bit cheaper. The difference between the 10400, 10500, and 10600 is 2 to 300 megahertz. That's it, and since they're lock parts, you won't be able to change that. The 10600K and its F variant are fully unlocked, providing you're using a Z series motherboard which will allow you to overclock them. The Core i7 range is somewhat simplified. There's two distinct 8 core 16 thread models, each with an F version that drops the iGPU. The Core i7 10700 is the locked part. It runs at a base clock of 2.9 GHz with a max turbo of 4.8 GHz, whereas the 10700K is unlocked and out of the box runs at at least 3.8 GHz for the base and 5.1 GHz for the boost. Both feature a 16 MB L3 cache, while the locked model receives a 65 watt TDP rating and the unlocked part a 120. 5 watt TDP rating. Finally, we have the mighty Core i9 range, offering 10 cores with 20 threads and a 20 megabyte L3 cache. Once again, there are four models in total, two of which are F variants. The 10900 is the base model, and as the 65 watt part, it features a rather low 2.8 gigahertz base frequency with a 5.1 gigahertz turbo. Then there's the unlocked 10900K, and thanks to a higher 125 watt TDP rating, it clocks no lower than 3.7 GHz with a max turbo boost of 5.2 GHz. Unfortunately, right now, many of these 10th gen core processors are either out of stock or selling well over the MSRP. It's a pretty rough time right now for supply anyway, and then on top of that, Intel is suffering from their 14 nanometer shortages, which seem to have been going on for years now. So getting your hands on a Core i9-10900K right now is nearly impossible, and good luck getting one for anywhere near $500 US. For this overview, I'll mostly be focusing on the 125 watt parts in the Core i5, Core i7, and Core i9 range, though I've also been able to get my hands on the 65 watt Core i5-10400 and Core i3-10100. Okay, so let's get on with it. For the testing, I'll be using our standard memory configuration, which sees us fully populate our ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Extreme motherboard with 8GB G-Skill Flarex CL14 modules for a 32GB capacity. Then, as usual, we're also using a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti to help alleviate the GPU bottleneck, allowing us to take a better look at the actual CPU performance. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the benchmark graphs. 
Starting with Cinebench R20, we find that the 10400 is just shy of 50% faster than the 10100, which makes sense given the i5 processor packs 50% more cores and the clock speeds are much the same. Then we see a 13% jump from the 10400 to the 10600, and this difference is a result of the operating clock speed. And of course, given that the k skew part is unlocked, that margin can be increased further by overclocking. Then we see an almost 40% increase when going from the 10600K to the 10700K, and of course that's largely due to the 33% increase in core count, with the rest made up by the clock speed, as the i7 processor is clocked around 6% higher. Finally, we see another big jump in performance with the 10900K, though this time we are only talking about a 29% increase, as the core count's only been increased by 25%, and the clock speeds are much the same. As for the single core performance, the 10900K produced the highest score here, beating the 10700K by a 7% margin, and the 10600K by a 14% margin, while the 10100 and 10400 were comparable. The most significant performance gains seen in the 7-zip file manager compression test are seen when moving from the 4-core Core, core i3-10100 to the 6-core 10400, which makes sense given that this is the most significant increase in core count, at least in terms of percentage. As a result, the 10400 was 55% faster than the 10100, while the 10600K was a further 8% faster. Then we see a 30% boost from the 10600K to the 10700K, which isn't insignificant, but you could certainly argue that the 16% increase seen when going from the 10700K to the 10900K is. At the very least, these results would make it difficult to justify the 30% increase in MSRP. Decompression performance is much improved as we're able to better utilize Intel's hyperthreading technology, and as a result, the 10900K is now 36% faster than the 10700K, and that makes it quite a bit easier to justify the 30% price premium for the 10 core processor. For serious rendering type workloads, you'll want to avoid the Core i3 range when possible, and spending a little bit more on, say, the Core i5-10400 will net you around 50% more performance. Granted, it costs around 50% more, though that won't be the case once you factor in the entire cost of the upgrade or the new system, but in reality, we're talking about $50, and that makes the 10400 a much better buy, in my opinion, or the 10400F if you can find it. Speaking of which, we again see that the difference between the 10400 and 10600K is very small, at least out of the box. So if you're going to buy the 10600K, you really want to be overclocking it, otherwise you might as well just save the $70 to $80 and just get the locked 10400. Ideally though, for this kind of workload, you will really want something like the 10700K or 10900K, at least when shopping exclusively with Intel. The 10700K offered a 35% performance boost over the 10600K, while the 10900K was a further 33% faster. Code compilation performance is very similar to what we found in the Blender test. We're looking at a 50% performance uplift when going from the 10100 to the 10400, then a further 11% for the 10600K. From the 10600K to the 10700K, you're again looking at a 30% performance increase, and then another 30% to the 10900K. Where the margins are a lot less predictable is video production work. Here the Core i3-10100 fares quite well, at least for the editing portion of the job. Here the 10400 was just 15% faster than the 10100, while the 10600K was just a few percent faster than the locked i5 model. Interestingly, we do see a reasonable boost in performance with the 10700K, but then only a very small step up with the 10900K, suggesting that 8 cores 16 thread is the sweet spot for this application. However, scaling is more consistent in Adobe Premiere 2020. Here we are seeing fairly consistent performance gains as the core count increases. For example, we see a 25% increase when going from the 10100 to the 10400, and then 16% from the 10700K to the 10900K. Adobe Photoshop mostly relies on single core performance, though having said that, I didn't expect to see a 47% performance increase from the Core i3-10100 to the Core i9-10900K. The i9 processor does enjoy a clock speed advantage as well as a much larger L3 cache capacity, but even so, I didn't expect the margin in this application to be quite as extreme. The margins seen in Adobe After Effects are a little more in line with what my Photoshop expectations were. Here the 10900K is 35% faster than the 10100, though the 10700K and 10600K are just 20% faster. It's also interesting to see the 10600K and 10700K producing the same score, while the 10900K is around 13% faster. This is clearly a result of higher sustained frequencies. As for power consumption, the Core i9-10900K, while a beast, does push total system consumption to 300 watts, and that's 70 watts over the 10700K. Meanwhile, the 10700K pushed system consumption just 30 watts higher than the 10600K. 
Time for a look at gaming performance, and first up we have Battlefield 5 at 1080p with the ultra quality preset using the RTX 2080 Ti. The 10700K and 10900K are both GPU limited, and as a result they deliver the same average 1% low performance. The 10600K also managed to produce the same average frame rate, but slipped away a bit for the 1% low, trailing by an 8% margin. We see a further 6% decline in performance with the 10400, and then a rather large 22% drop off with the 10100. However, by increasing the resolution to 1440p for a more realistic test scenario, we find very little difference in performance between the 10400, 10600K, 10700K, and 10900K. In fact, the average frame rates are virtually identical, while the 10900K is almost 10% faster than the 10400 when comparing the 1% low performance. All that said, the Core i3-10100 does still trail by a noticeable margin, and while the performance is far from poor, you will at times be able to notice the difference between the 10100 and 10400. Far Cry New Dawn is very sensitive to clock frequency and cache performance, and here we again see a reasonably large performance uplift when moving from the 10100 to the 10400. Here the i5 processor was up to 25% faster. Of course, the jump from the 10400 to the 10600 is much smaller, and the 8% increase is in line with the clock frequency difference. Then we're looking at a further 9% boost when stepping up to the 10700K, and the i7 part is basically able to match the 10900K. As we've seen many times in the past, increasing the resolution to 1440p can actually increase CPU load, and as a result the processors that were already struggling, like the Core i3-10100, fall even further behind the competition. Here the 10400 went from 25% faster at 1080p to 31% faster at 1440p. Next up we have the Gears Tactics results, and here we're looking at virtually identical performance using either the 10600K, 10700K, or 10900K. Again, it's really only the Core i3-10100 that struggles, trailing the 10400 by up to a 20% margin. Increasing the resolution to 1440p sees that margin reduced quite drastically, down to just 7% as the game becomes primarily GPU limited. For titles like Ghost Recon Breakpoint that aren't particularly CPU sensitive, you won't notice a big difference between the Core i3-10100 and Core i9-10900K for example. This is especially true when testing under more realistic conditions such as 1440p. Here the 10900K was up to 7% faster than the 10100 and on average rendered just 3 FPS more. So for games that don't require more than 4 cores and aren't sensitive to CPU performance, these are the kind of margins you can expect to find between the 10th gen core processors. Next up we have Rainbow Six Siege, and again, the 10700K and 10900K are seen delivering virtually identical performance at 1080p. The 10600K is very close, though we do see a 12% reduction in 1% low performance, and then as expected the 10600K and 10400 are very similar, and then we see a further 17% reduction with the Core i3-10100. However, once again we find when increasing the resolution of 1440p, the added strain on the GPU is enough to almost completely eliminate the FPS margin. Here the Core i5, i7 and i9 processors all deliver virtually the same level of performance, while the Core i3-10100 is up to 13% slower when comparing the 1% low results. Certainly one of the most CPU demanding games that we currently test with is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and this is one that you'll ideally want a 6 core 12 thread processor for. As you can see the Core i5 models aren't far behind the 8 and 10 core i7 and i9 parts, whereas the quad core Core i3-10100 is up to 39% slower. Increasing the resolution of 1440p reduces the margin between the i5, i7 and i9 processors quite drastically. Now the 10900K is only 12% faster than the Core i5-10400 when comparing the 1% low performance. However, when compared to the Core i3-10100 it's up to 33% faster, and even the 10400 is 19% faster when comparing 1% low performance. So not an ideal game for those using quad-core processors, and we'll surely see more of this moving forward. The last game we're looking at is Red Dead Redemption 2, and here we have another title that doesn't play particularly well with quad-core processors, even those with SMT support. Although we see virtually identical performance between the various Core i5, i7, and i9 processors, the Core i3-10100 was up to 27% slower. That said, increasing the resolution to 1440p did drastically reduce that margin, and now the Core i3-10100 is up to 14% slower than the 10900K, and 9% slower than the 10400, again when using an RTX 2080 Ti. 
So that's how the various 10th gen core processors compare for budget gaming PCs or general computing. The Core i3-10100 works well enough, though for not a great deal more, I feel the Core i5-10400 is a much better investment. The Core i3-10300 and Core i3-10320, they might fare a little better thanks to the larger L3 cache capacity and the slightly higher clock frequencies, but considering both are quite a bit more expensive, I think it makes even more sense to just get the Core i5-10400. In fact, if you can find it, the Core i5-10400F is the way to go. That is, of course, if you don't require an iGPU, and if so, that part may actually be better value than the Ryzen 5 3600, again, depending on price. At around $160 US, it's a mighty tempting alternative, and even at the current $170 US, it looks to be an excellent deal, so certainly keep it in mind. Beyond that, the Core i5-10500 and 10600 certainly won't be worth the price premium, at least not at the current asking prices. Even the 10600K is a bit of a stretch right now at a little over $300 US, but if you plan to overclock it, then it can make sense for high refresh rate gaming. The Core i7-10700K is also a little overpriced right now, and at $410 US, you really need to be able to put those eight cores to work. Then we have the Core i9-10900K, which is a beast of a processor, but at $530, it's around $100 more than AMD's 12-core 24-thread Ryzen 9 3900X, so that's a bit of a problem for Intel, though perhaps an even bigger problem is the fact that it's out of stock everywhere, and that's pretty much been the situation since its release. Anyway, that's Intel's 10th Gen Core series in a nutshell, so we'll end the video here. If you did enjoy the video, then you know what to do. You can also subscribe for more content like this, and we also have a Patreon account, so check that out if you're interested. There's a couple of cool things over there. You get access to our exclusive Discord server where you can chat with Tim, myself, and the rest of the awesome Harbour Unbox community. We have, uh, what do we got, monthly live stream that's coming up shortly on the alternate channel, the, the Patreon exclusive channel, but yeah, live stream where you can ask us questions there live and we'll, we'll answer those. Uh, Q and A's, behind the scenes videos. Anyway, if you're interested, links in the video description, as I said, but above all else, thank you very much for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.